Another edition of One on One with Mitch LaFon. I am your host, Mitch LaFon, and this week I've got, of course, uh, Russ Dwarf of the Killer Dwarves joining me once again as my co-host. Hello, Russ. How you doing, Mitch? Always how's good. The, Always how, good when I'm talking to you. How's the weather out in Montreal? Always crappy. <laughs> yeah. But, well, you know, what are you going to do? It's, yep. uh, it's one of those things. Hey, before we get started, let, let me just take a chance to say thank you to all the fans out there. A lot of folks have signed up to the podcast on iTunes and uh, follow along on uh, Spreaker, and the numbers are, are, are fantastic. I mean, it's, it's, it blows my mind to know that that many people tune in every week to listen to what I have to say and what you have to say and, and whoever yeah. else might be co-hosting once in a while, but... Uh, you know, people, and, people love music, man. They and they, they love that you, you really, you have a passion for it, and you can, uh, you know, you have a great uh, character uh, in your personality that brings out all these great juicy tidbits from everyone. Yeah, the, the, the fun stuff. But what's also really great uh, from my perspective is having you on here, just because. Uh, again, I, I think we mentioned it last time. You were there. You lived it. You were on the bus. You were on the planes. You did the tours of Japan and of Canada and of the States. And you played the shitty bars and you played the arenas. And, and that's a perspective that a lot of the fans, uh, including myself, can't always appreciate the way you can. And so you, you, add, a, you, you add nice color commentary to the whole thing. So um, anyway, with that said, let, let's get into to today's episode. I, I tracked down two guys of the band Foreigner. Uh, bassist Jeff Pilson, who of course used to be in Dawkin, and uh, Tom Gimble, the uh, saxophonist slash backing vocalist slash keyboardist slash guitarist. Holy slash! He's not slash, is he? He's not slash, but there's oh, a lot man. of slashes to his name. And, he, and, he's you know, he's more slash than slash. He really is. Well, and what's really fun about Tom is that growing up. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, you know, 70s, 80s, and 90s. I, I was a big fan of Aerosmith, and uh, he was with Aerosmith for a long time as their touring saxophonist hidden I, keyboard guy. I, I did not know that. Yeah, and so... I'm a huge Aerosmith fa fan myself. Yeah, so if, if you saw the uh, Pump Tour or the Get a Grip Tour and all those tours back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, you saw Tom. And then he moved on to, to Foreigner. And so so I, I talked to Tom about that uh, during the interview. And, of course, with Jeff, we talk about his time in uh, Dawkin. But, um, you know, what's remarkable about Foreigner is the fact that they changed lead singers. They, 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 they moved over to Kelly Hansen, who came mm -hmm. over from Hurricane. And uh, he replaced Lou Graham. And, and the band sounds absolutely fantastic if you go getting comfortable there russ i, I just getting comfortable i was i was starting to fall asleep anyways no i'm kidding <laughs> i'm giving you the most fabulous intro you've ever i know heard. i'm hearing i'm loving this and i've just uh got a lot a lot to say about it too yeah uh, okay so 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 the point being is that if you go to a foreigner show you get to see kelly and he's just so enthusiastic and, and he's just so wonderful as 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 a singer so um but he's the second guy so, so let's talk yeah. singers let's, let's, yeah. let's talk you're a singer in a band i'm an entertainer no i'm the singer yes well i'm more of an entertainer i'm not i'm not like this huge technician but you know i love singing and i i'm a singer for sure you know to me elvis is a singer steven tyler's a singer uh, uh you know even even though I'm a singer, I'm a huge fan of all these these cats as well too. Go, oh, you can hear my dog barking in the background. I know, I, I know. That, that's what that, that's what I love about having a rock and roll co-host is that there's just no rules. They're 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 napping. They're they got yes. Dogs. Well, I, I you know. Anyways, we'll uh, I'll, I'll uh, ramble on in a minute. But yes, I am a singer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we got that right. Now, now you've never been replaced in the Killer Dwarves. So so let's let, let, let's look at, at bands that have replaced singers and why it works sometimes and why other times it doesn't work. First of all, um, could you be replaced in the Killer Dwarves? Do you think? Ah, uh, you know, we, I've been asked this question before. I I 
you know. And it was by your I, bandmates. I, I don't think they would. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they would. You never know. Maybe you'll have to do a different interview. It's it's so hard, I think. You know, it's a huge uh, question to ask about any band I, from our genre, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. to, to uh, replace people. I don't know. You know, obviously, I'm narcissistic when it comes to me and think, oh, I'm irreplaceable. But I guess anybody can be replaced. And the proof's in the pudding with bands like Foreigner and Journey. You know, uh, I know people like go, oh, they're cover bands or whatever now because they don't have the original singer. But, you know, uh, this ha this has happened for a long time. I saw Chicago like 20 years ago and they had uh, replaced Peter Cetera. And this guy was like unbelievable. He was right. like Rich Little. You know, you, if you close your eyes, it was the guy. It depends on what the band is going for. If they want to get a, you know, impersonator, you know, there's the two different roads to go down, or they're going to be somebody completely different and original. Like, you know, when you have a circumstance like ACDC, right. where it's a tragedy and, you know, it's either we stop or we continue on with another guy, you know, obviously they didn't get a guy that sounded like Bond, but he's a unique, you know, Brian's unique Brian in Bond. his own way. And yeah, Brian Johnson's unique in his own way. And, you know, has obviously been in the band probably three times as long as Bond now, okay, but so there's, but there's still those camps, too, that people, you know, they don't accept it. It's hard for people to accept, right? But what makes you unique? Uh, I, I don't know. It might be my show. It might be the show that I put on. You, I'm sure you could replace me uh, in the band uh, and play the songs, but it wouldn't be me. You know, it wouldn't be the same thing. I think, you know, uh, there's a lot of bands from that era that I feel the same way about, you know. Like, I don't want to make, I'm not trying to make enemies or, this is just my opinion and stuff, you know what I mean? Right. You just, sometimes you can't replace them, but, you know, and then it becomes a big, ugly situation with, with, you know, especially with social media and everything. And I don't want to mention names because I'm sure you can exactly think who I'm thinking of, you know, when they replace singers and they don't get along anymore. I don't, I just, you know, it's hard. I, I'll tell you when I, uh. In the in the early '90s, a, a, a huge band approached me, right? And I was still in the Dwarfs. I don't. I'm sure I've told you this story, but I don't really want to mention their name. I'm not trying to be a, a goof or anything, but right. I just I just think it's a private uh, affair with myself and them. And uh, I actually did go and audition for them and everything, and we got along great. And we've known each other a long time and everything. And and, and it was one of those circumstances where they picked another guy over me. And in my mind, I was thinking, oh, I love this band a lot. They were, you know, a great band, but it wasn't my band. Right. You know what I mean? And it, it would have been a great opportunity for me because I liked the people that were in that band. But I, you know, and I don't want to give too much away because everybody will know exactly who it is. Right. But anyways, do you, do you regret not getting the job with Metallica? No, uh, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, Man I told you it was Menudo. Oh, right, uh, right, right. But I had pubic hair already. But, I, I, you know, it's hard to replace bands. Like, it's like the Judas Priest, uh, Iron Maiden, you know what well, I mean? Let me give you some names, actually. Let, let, uh, let's, start, right. let's start off with a Canadian guy. All right. Sebastian Bach was in Skid Row. Mm -hmm. And when you think Skid Row, like it or lump it, most people think Sebastian Bach. Now, Johnny is a great singer, Johnny mm -hmm. Solinger, yep. great singer. I love what the band's doing live, mm -hmm. but here we are some 20 years later and people say, uh, Sebastian's got to come back. Why in that case is it not as successful or, or, or has it not been as uh, accepted, do you think? That's a, that, see, and that, that's a situation that's a really hard call. You know what I mean? And I don't think that's a point uh, of, you know, ability or, any kind of talent or anything. I think that's a personality issue with, you know, the people that you work with and everything. Right. And, uh, but what makes the, the band, the band accepts, accepts the new guy, you know what I mean? And I guess there is fans that do, I don't know. Sebastian's a great singer. He has a unique character. He's like, you know, a Rob Halford or a, a Bruce Dickinson there. The voice is just, you know, it paints a picture uh, of that band you you can't deny it it's, not, it's undeniable it's undeniable you, know what I mean? no, 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 you just mentioned the name so, so let me throw some names at you and see if you know what band i'm talking about uh original singer was paul day 
Second singer was Dennis Wilcock. Have any idea who I'm talking about? Mm, I don't. Is uh, this Maiden? Is this Maiden? Well, well, all right. All right. Well, I was going to throw <laughs> out the third name, and I think you were going to get it there, uh, Paul Diano. Yeah, it's Maiden. Okay, I didn't. Maiden. I didn't. I didn't even realize they had two singers before Diano. Right, but when you think of Iron Maiden, mm -hmm. I think of Bruce. You think of Bruce, but he's he's essentially the fourth out of five singers. Yeah, right? see, so they had Blaze and, Bailey come in after. That's right, and so uh, he's a replacement singer. That's the point. Yeah, yeah, but you know, everybody's going to know the, the the traditional or classic Maiden is going to be uh, Bruce, or you know, but there's still the hardcore fans that would. Go with the first album with Deano, right? Right. You know, <laughs> there's so much history with Bruce. You know what I mean? And they and all and he he did leave for a while and everything. And I, I don't think the fans accepted it. You know what I mean? That, that's a hardcore band too, and that's a hardcore all, 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 hardcore audience too. <clears throat> hardcore fan base. Yeah, yeah. They're just you know we we toured with Iron Maiden in in the '80s and. Uh, uh, opening up for Iron Maiden is is no picnic. It's no no walk in the bloody park. I'll tell you that. You yeah. know, you really really have to have your shit together to win them over and stuff. You know what I mean? But it, I, it's a matter of taste. I guess it's a matter of fans. If they didn't have a lot of fans, people, you know, people are fickle. I guess you know, it's yeah. hard to it's hard to say. They, you know, and with music. It, it, you know, plucks the heartstrings of the humans, even if it is like metal or anything, it's still touches people. And I, uh, you know, they're like, could you replace uh, James in Metallica? But, but I guess that's the point of this discussion. Mm. Can you change pretty much anybody? I mean, you know, uh, look at some bands that have been, that have had success. Uh, Robert Fleischman was a singer. <clears throat> right. And, and then we had, Steve Perry and everybody said, "Yeah, you can't replace him." You're right, and he overshadowed him. And then you then and then you got Arnell Panetta. Now, mm -hmm. has he was he part of the classic songs, so on and so forth? No, but when mm -hmm. you go to a Journey show these days, you see a fantastic show. I mean, Arnell is fantastic. He's very yeah. believable. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I, the, you know, these singers have passion. You know, we were just on the Monsters of Rock cruise, and, and Great White's there, and uh, Terry that, Lewis. He's an awesome singer, and he's a great showman. And uh, I don't think you know they've missed a beat with that, right? And Jack's still doing his thing and everything, you know. And Jack has a, a great, a unique voice, but you know, I think a lot of these situations are personal problems. You know, Queensrÿche, the whole that old thing you know why can't we all just get along now i'm gonna get replaced next week after i've done this show i know isn't that funny but yeah. you know listen i love jeff tate jeff tate to me is the voice of queens right but that said me too the new guy he's amazing the guy's like he's shockingly uh you know an excellent excellent singer there's no is, doubt about it is that a mistake though to try to get a singer that sounds exactly like the guy you're replacing well see i guess that's the fine line right you know you find like, like i keep saying rich little and i don't know if it, if you don't know who rich little is he was a canadian comedian who has impersonated people perfectly but it's i guess it's a, a it's got to be up to the band if the band isn't happy in their circumstances you know you think it's going to translate to the audience right. if they're if they're miserable up there and they're just they have a guy in the band that they hate, but they love his voice. I, I, I just, I think when you're young, it's a different story. When you're older, you need to please yourself, or you're not going to be able to please your audience. But, it's but just, the, it's reality. But take away the love hate uh, for a second. I mean, forget that they love or hate Jeff Jeff Tate. Is it a good idea to get a guy that's going to sound exactly like Jeff? If you're going to make the switch, shouldn't you try to reestablish the band as a? new brand as a new band is because yeah i would have i think they tried to do that though didn't queen strike try to do that didn't they they were called something else for a minute when they were having that battle well the, yeah they were called oh, south forgot, southwest or something something or, west uh yeah, yeah. Uh, let, let me uh, let me grind my brain for a second here they were called um uh, but i mean it wasn't really the whole band uh, it was called rising west right 
but it wasn't the whole band. It was just a couple of the guys that had gone off and done this quote unquote well, side project. And then it morphed into yeah. being uh, new Quinton. Now Todd, uh, Todd Latour is fantastic. I mean, he, he really does a great job. Oh, absolutely. I, I was on the cruise with him last year and he, uh, he definitely, and that was when they first started with him, and he was uh, kicking ass for sure. And I think he sounds a lot like Jeff. Like, he really pulls that stuff off. He's unique, too, but he's got a lot of that, you know, right. his his tone and everything is is the same, you know. Anyways, it's, I think it's all, it's all a personal issue with everyone. Like, we can't please everybody. You know, and and honestly, it's only music. We're, we don't have to cure to cancer here, but right. you know, it's an it, it's an interesting topic because it always comes up, and people have asked me this question as well. I think we've talked about it too. You know, it's like when you know trying to you know replace these guys that are really really icons of the of their genre and everything, like Rob Halford or something. Right. You know what I mean? It's like it it's it's got to be incredibly stressful for the band, and I can't imagine. For the actual, uh, you know, person that has to step into these shoes, the right. the, the stress level has got to be unbelievable. Like, right. you know, to, to go out in front of these fans, like, I think I, I've seen this YouTube stuff of Iron Maiden with Blaze, and there's some, like, serious uh, people not accepting him during a show, and it's almost like a fight. Nice. <laughs> and, and this is not... This is not where those cats come from. Like Maiden are the nicest guys you'd ever meet, and they, you know, they love their fans to death. But you can just feel the tension. Well, okay, let's look at some bands that have that have replaced their lead singer and have had essentially the same amount of success. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm going to think of Genesis. I mean, Genesis right. with Peter <clears throat> Gabriel were huge, right? But then they got Phil Collins. And here's a band that now with Phil, it's a completely different vocal style. They're doing completely yep. different songs. They're a massive. They're, band. they're they're essentially two different bands when you think about it. Yeah, they and, are, and they're massive. Uh, and then the other band I'm going to think, and I'll have you talk about them too, is Van Halen. You uh, cannot argue that with David Lee Roth, they were massive. But you cannot yeah. argue that with Sammy Hager, they were no. massive. <laughs> And those are bands where they've changed the singer, but they've also changed the sound of the band. They didn't have yeah. Sammy Hager singing, um, yeah. you know, Romeo's Delight. Yeah, and, Ice Cream Man or something. Right. So, so l let's talk a little bit about situations mm -hmm. like that then. Um, I, and that's what I, I was getting at with Todd. Like, should, yeah. should you just sort of change the direction of the band? I think in those circumstances, like a Van Halen or, or so, something like that, this are so established already. It's an anomaly, but they're these people are so uh, dedicated and passionate and talented you know what i mean some something's gonna good's gonna come out you know no matter what it's just inevitable it's like painting or something and you're a good you're a great painter already okay well the, the paintings might their character might change or something you know like i love van halen and i i love both van halens and you know well there's all, there's three van halens and, and that, it, that i think that that's that proves the point yeah. Uh, it worked with Sammy. Why yep. didn't it work with Gary Sharon? I don't know. There's a there's there's another situation that's it's hard to to predict any kind kind of thing because like when that whole situation went down, I think it seemed that Eddie was just over the moon, thinking that they had found the guy. This is the guy, but maybe it's a, a, a psychological or what's the circumstances you're going through there. It's one thing to be in a room with people, you know rehearsing or getting along really well and then but it's another thing to present it in, in public it, it's two different entities completely you know what i mean you can rehearse till the cows come home it does not matter if you're not out there in front of people and, and I, I i don't think they accepted that album or him or him like in, in that band and he's a, another singer that's just over the top talented you know those extreme albums are like they're perfect right you know like they're they're amazing songwriters in that element but put him in the van halen element and people didn't buy it and, and didn't dig it let me ask you you know? Uh, you know van halen was managed by ray daniels who was out in toronto and of course you're out in toronto yes did you ever have any connections to the van halen world do you know any of the guys did you ever get to meet them were you managed by ray did, were, were you ever part of that world or I'm not in Toronto. Don't get, don't give people the false impression. Well, you no, were back in, no, the, back I know, in those I, days. Yeah, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, we actually were, and 
uh, acquainted with uh, Van Halen and uh, uh, and uh, and Six Degrees of Separation through SRO, which is Ray Daniels and uh, Ed Leffler was managing them too. But uh, my connection with them was uh, when we uh, did um, Dirty Weapons. Oh, let's see what was happening then. Uh, we we were down uh, in LA doing that, and Eddie. Uh, Andy Johns was doing uh, F-U-C-K and uh, when we started uh, the second uh, record with Andy Method to the Madness and ended up at uh, you know meeting Eddie and being at the ho- at his house and Michael and Alex and uh, uh, he, just through Andy Johns and stuff and I was up at the house when they were doing stuff but uh, plus a good friend of ours was was teching for them so you eventually meet everybody anyways but they they would come to the studio and they lent us a bunch of stuff and we ended up being acquainted with them and stuff I actually but didn't you become f- f- friends with Michael Anthony Michael is a great friend yeah, absolutely he's an awesome dude uh, one of the nicest people you'd ever meet in rock and roll he's the most down to earth uh kick-ass dude and he you know he's there's another super talented cat right Right. just absolutely the nicest guy you'd ever meet you know i'm uh, i'm sure you know people that are have met him uh, know exactly what i'm talking about but really down-to-earth guy and uh, a a real sweetheart of a person yeah it's too bad that uh they ended up throwing him out of the band because i I think his backing vocals really adds an element to that band that is irreplaceable now we're talking about lead singers being uh yeah. replaced but yeah. there are also some great background <clears> vocalists <throat> that when they're no longer in the band i'm thinking of Juan cruce and rat when he left for a yeah. while mm-hmm. and michael anthony um, yeah, Ma- michael it, definitely there, there's an element of the band that uh, part of their heart gets ripped out and people don't notice yeah it's you know <laughs> Okay, bands are fucked up. Oh, can you say fucked up on the radio? Well, of course, well, uh, it's a podcast, so of course. Yeah, I, it's, you know, just talking about this, it's it's almost stressful to think of all the, you know, animosity and stuff that can happen uh, uh, with uh, these bands that make such great music, you know what I mean? And you, you want your childhood favorite band to be together forever, but unfortunately, it's not reality. It's like when you start out and you're 16 years old, we're going to make it together, you know. And right. It's, <laughs> now, now let's, speaking of making it, let, let's, we, 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 we've, we've talked quite a bit here at the front of the show. Let's, let's mm-hmm. listen to uh, Tom yes. of uh, Foreigner talk about uh, Kelly Hansen. And, of course, um, you know, Tom was also gonna t- is talking to me about the, uh, his t- the time he spent in Aerosmith. Cool. And he talks to me about the band's uh, soundtrack of Summer Tour coming up with Styx and Don Felder of the Eagles. And we get into some other stuff, but uh, let, let's just turn it over yeah. here over to Tom and have a listen. Let's, let's hear this. We are here with Tom of Foreigner. How are you doing, Tom? Doing great, Mitch. How's it going? Great, great. So, so listen. Uh, you know, up until 2013, I had never seen Foreigner live, and then last year I saw you in Montreal, and again this year in February I saw you in Montreal, and I was blown away. I mean, the band is absolutely fantastic. Um, oh, thanks, thanks. You know, your singer Kelly is an absolute national treasure. You you cannot lose him. He he has got to stay in that band forever. I sure hope so. I hope that happens because we are just couldn't be happier to see the way he connects with the audience. You know, the look on the audience's face is like, we've never really had this happen before. You know, it's completely uncharted territory, and he's just rewriting the book. I mean, yeah. he talks to every single person like he knows them, you know, like you're familiar with them. You're part of his family. Yeah. And uh, it's really nice. It, it, it adds a personal touch to it. It's not, you know, just us here and you're over there. That kind of, There's no wall in between. He's out there dancing with people, sharing their drinks, kissing girls, <laughs> body surfing. The other night we look over and they're just holding him up in the air and he's kind of pointing like, <laughs> which direction he wants to go. Crowd surfing. Is that what he call it? Crowd, Crowd surfing. surfing. Yeah, I mean, he did that yeah. in Montreal in February. He just started walking over the seats and taking uh, selfies, as the, everybody likes to call it, with people. It was the most outrageous thing. But more importantly, his voice just suits the music. Yeah. 
right? Yes, yes, yes. That's the starting point. I think that's why people love him right out of the gate because he's singing these songs to perfection, and that is it's an inhuman task. You're absolutely right. We we say that about him. Like he's not from this planet. Right. You cannot just sing those songs and go, yeah, no big deal. It is a big deal, and the fact that he does it flawlessly night after night is just nothing short of astonishing. And you throw the showmanship on top of that, you got the real deal, complete package. Yeah, the, the well, let's get let's talk about a complete package. This summer, you're going out with Sticks, and of course, Don Felder, formerly of the oh, yeah. Eagles. Uh, let's talk about that package now. Is it's a co-headline because you're swapping in and out, right? Some nights you close, some yes. nights Sticks closes. Uh huh. Right. That's right. So, so, so just to touch about, I got to say, Don Felder is, is the most amazing guitar player you'd ever want to see. So people need to know that. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> he's too good. He shouldn't be allowed to be that good. That's the way we feel about it. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. So, 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 what are the fans going to see on this tour? Is it just a, a night of just nothing but hits? Well, hopefully nobody will get hit. You know. Um, <laughs> One of the things I like about rock concerts is not like a, a football game where you have one side wins and one side loses. Hopefully everybody wins except the guy that drinks too much and falls asleep and wakes up after it's over. Uh, you know, I think that it's going to be everyone's trying to bring their A game to the table. You know, there's also a, a healthy competition that goes on between bands. So, we're going to try and, and kick Sticks' ass, you know, and they're going to try and kick ours. That's just the way it goes. <laughs> it's, it's certainly going to make for a great evening for fans. And I, I also want to talk about this soundtrack of summer compilation that comes out uh, exclusively at Walmart. Uh, um, are the songs that, that are on there the old Foreigner versions, or is this the new band that we're going to hear? Uh, which songs... Which, well, you've sorry, got Cold of Eyes, Hot Blooded, uh, Urgent. Are, is this? Mm -hmm. Are these remakes with with the current lineup? Oh, you mean on the album? Right. If you're looking at, it depends which disc you're looking at. Which, what do we got going? Well, I'm looking at the uh, the, the set, the track listing for the song soundtrack of Summer Tour album, which is coming out. Uh -huh. uh, it's coming out in in a month or less than a month now. Um, uh huh. Do you know if they're remakes or are these uh, or are these sort of the catalog versions that they they pulled off the old albums? No, I'm assuming that's that's coming from our album, which was called Jukebox Heroes. That's okay. when we redid those classics in the studio. Okay, okay, that's yeah. what I was wondering. Okay, and, and, uh -huh. and then there's a couple of uh, compilation where everyone got together from the three different bands. Right. I don't know if it lists that, like Hotel California, everybody has a little segment from all the three different bands. Pretty right. cool. It's right. Well, that, that, that was the thing. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that. Don redid the uh, song with you guys, so so you've got Tommy playing on it, and you've got, uh, who else is playing on that? Uh, Tommy Shaw's playing on it. Everybody, I mean, the whole, all three of you guys are together Oh, Mick Jones. It. Yeah, Mick Jones. you got okay. Mick Jones there. Sure. That's a fun Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's the hybrid uh, Sticks Foreigner, Don Felder experience <laughs> it's, a great, it's a great version and hotel california is a classic song to start off with yeah oh yeah uh, sets the tone and now i do want to look a little bit back in your history years and years ago 20 years ago you were on the road with this american band that probably nobody's ever heard of called aerosmith how was oh, it yeah. <laughs> oh yeah how how was it touring with aerosmith back in the late 80s and early 90s, keeping in mind that they had broken up, they had had all kinds of drug problems, they got back together. Um, what, was the, what was the vibe on the road with that band at the time? It was, it was, it was tremendous. They, had, uh, they were actually in, in the Phoenix. You know, they had risen up again. Right. This was like the second time they had climbed out of the, <laughs> the rut. Remember they had that album called Night in the Ruts? They climbed yeah. out of the ruts and they were back on top again. Uh, this was when the album... Uh, permanent Pump Vacation? First came. Well, yeah. Well, they went from the ruts to the Permanent Vacation. Where, you didn't play on Permanent... You weren't on the Permanent Vacation no, tour. Right? right after that. You started right with... At, it was okay, right so, after that. This so you started with Pump. After that. So we were still playing those songs. We were still playing those songs live, Ragdoll. 
a lot of them had that great shuffly kind of bluesy swing and swagger to them. A song called Hangman Jerry, oh, that's a lie on the track of that guy. You know, it was really cool. Uh, was so those songs were great when we did them unplugged. It was one of the first unplugged yeah. for MTV. And uh, so we still did those songs in, in the show, and it was all the great new stuff. Hot wax dripping, honey, what do you say? You know, it was a, just a marvelous time. They were clean and sober. They were healthy. They were so into fitness and working out. I went to see Stephen at his house, and we could do vocal exercise. And he said, let's go for a jog. And I was like, okay. We started jogging. He goes, now let's do the vocal exercise. <laughs> I said, you can't run and sing at the same time. He goes, welcome to my world. <laughs> <laughs> and if you look at the the video from 89 and 90, it's true. He never stopped moving. I used to watch him go right back and forth, just side to side on the stage, like a whirling dervish spinning, singing at the same time. It was insane. Uh, so I really felt like he, he, he was top of their game, you know. Oh, Joe Perry was just the coolest ever, obviously. Yeah, you know, I must have seen the, that tour and, the, and then the tour right after with um, uh, Get a Grip. Probably mm. ten times each kind of thing. I mean, it, it was just a phenomenal, All right. uh, phenomenal time. Um, yeah. If you if you can, and I know it's an unfair question, but can you sort of give me the uh, pros and cons of Joe Perry versus Mick Jones? Like, what what makes them great at what they do, and and sort of how do you compare mm -hmm. and contrast Joe versus Mick? Well, you know. We're talking about like iconic players yeah. and you know, people at the top of the world class. What I notice is a lot of similarities okay. when you get to people on that level. And this is Stephen and Joe and Mick and Lou. I notice a lot of similarities. And what it boils down to is an innate sense of musicianship that I notice. These guys, they know what's right. They know what to leave out and they know what to leave in. They just have a natural ability to know that. And I think that's what, what sets them apart from, you know, almost everyone else. Uh, so I see a lot of similarities. I, and as far as my interaction with them, what I noticed in Aerosmith and Foreigner, they were interested in, in bringing the most out. They, they never wanted to paint me into a corner and say, just do this. They wanted to get as much out and, and see you flourish, you know. In, in Foreigner, I remember Mick and Lou saying, take that saxophone and tear the roof off this house. And just, if we like what you're doing, we're going to tell you, go around again. You know, I'd, I'd be wailing this solo. I'd be, ah, they'd say, go around again. <laughs> so there was never a restriction. It was, you know, an encouragement and enhanced, you know. And, and, and Aerosmith, Joey Kramer said, you want to do a funky thing with, like, sax and, and drums, yeah. like Tower of Power? And I said, yeah, I do. You know, so if you saw the tour, you saw that. I did. And it was marvelous. Yeah, Tom Hamilton would be playing this funky bass line. Go, bah, 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 bah. It was very Tower of Power. And Joey Kramer just said, I love Tower of Power, and I want to do something like it. Will you do it with me? And I was like, oh, you just twist my arm a little bit. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you mentioned Tom Hamilton. Uh, he's mm -hmm. definitely one of the most underrated bass players. He's not flashy. He's not like Gene Simmons with the tongue and the paint. But he just so has true. a groove yeah. that he le he's just a foundation to every song. I mean, he's, you know, just listen yeah. to what he does on Sweet Emotion, for example, right? I mean, absolutely right. Very musical, too. Yeah. Very musical. He knows how to use the full range of the bass. You won't see him just staying down low, and you won't see him just only playing up high. He's constantly going between the two, and I think that could be, you know, part of the magic of their flavor of sound, the rock sound, is it's not just rooted in low bass notes, uh, you know, which is something that I always have loved, you know, like bands like Cream, the early rock yeah. bands. Cream and, and even Jeff Hotel, they would have those bass lines that were up there kind of playing a different note than everyone else. I love that sound, and that's very much a part of the sound of Aerosmith. Yeah, absolutely. Now, l l let's talk about the sound Big of time. Foreigner. You're in charge mm -hmm. of uh, rhythm guitar, keyboards, yeah. sax, Some, flute. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I think you play the triangle. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but... How, how, we do a lot of singing. You, you do a lot of singing. You do a lot of stuff on, on stage. How do you prepare yourself for a show? And what, what's the toll physically? I mean, you know, to come out and just sort of, you know, use just your fingers on a guitar is one thing. But now you're, 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 you're doing wind instruments. Are you the most tired at the end of the night compared to anybody else in that band? 
I don't know. Maybe maybe uh, mentally tired, but it doesn't feel that way. You know, we've been doing it for so many years. Uh, bouncing around between instruments has its uh, pros and cons because on the one hand, it, you're always on your toes. You know, you can't just get into a groove and stay there. I'm shifting gears. You're right. That is a bit of a challenge. Uh, so it takes some concentration. It's, I really have to snap my head around, just grab the sax, get it warmed up in about 45 seconds or a minute and then hit the stage and play urgent. That is a, is a challenge every night. So uh, in order to prepare for that, I might get a chance to warm up a little bit before the show. Uh, sometimes I don't. We get there late and I never have a chance. So the first time I touch the sax is basically 60 seconds before the song starts. <laughs> it's wow. kind of... It's kind of like throwing yourself in the deep end to see if you can swim, you know. So it never gets boring, that's for sure. <laughs> do, you, do you ever get tripped up? Do you ever uh, reach for that other guitar and then it's like, oh, shoot, I'm supposed to be reaching for the saxophone. Oh, uh, once in a blue moon. If you <laughs> misread the set list, sure, sure. But someone will always just kind of point you in the right direction or, or give you the right guitar and say, yeah. Trust me, this is the right way to go. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, Foreigner, the, the songs are, are enduring. What, what makes the songs so special? Why do you think they've connected with an audience? And even though you've changed members and stuff, the songs still bring the fans out. What, what, what makes them so special? Well, for one thing, there's nothing like a live concert. You know, we, we talked about you could have the biggest screen TV. You can have a theater in your house, a full 400-seat theater with a big screen and the best stereo on the face of the earth. It's not even close to what a real concert sounds like. So there's there's a lot of magic right there in the sound. The other thing is that the interaction between the band and the audience mm -hmm. cannot be duplicated. You know, even with a hologram, people say, oh, well, you could just have a hologram. You know, stones will be right in your living room but they won't be interacting with you. So right. this is the part of the magic of a live show. I think that's why people come out because there's no other place that that happens. It, it just doesn't occur anywhere else. So to see that, you have to be there. And as far as the songs uh, lasting and, and resonating, I think it's because they hit people on an emotional level uh, and a physical level. You know, when we're talking about good rock music, we're talking about drums that were played extremely well mm -hmm. and, you know, world-class uh, production and, and performance uh, on top of which you've got this masterpiece of a song that was crafted by award-winning songwriters, you know, in the Hall of Fame songwriting. So this is a lot of things working together to give you this complete uh hybrid, uh, you know, it's like an amalgamation of elements. I, I think about the rock at being at the base of it, a very almost British sound of a rock band, and then uh, a lot of the vocals have this kind of bluesy rock uh, R&B flavored singing over the top. So that's a kind of a unique combination, and it, and it really works well. And now we've got these lyrics that were heartfelt, really, you know, I think Mick has told us before that he wrote a song once and he was in tears while he was writing it. I mean, he puts that kind of emotion into the writing. He doesn't just spew them out. This is a real uh, world-class craftsman at songwriting, gifted songwriter, mm -hmm. artist. So uh, there, there you have this potpourri, you know, this, <laughs> this wonderful combination, a booyah base <laughs> of uh, ingredients that uh, give you the songs that I think is, uh, the combination of which why they have stood the time Test the time. Test so well. Test the time, the time test. Yeah, so the well. time test. And of course, you've got mm. Jeff Pilson who came over from Doc and who's, I mean, years oh, ago, like 15 years. He, yeah. he is just fantastic. He is tremendous. And he's now, you're a 10 year guy now. <laughs> so we've gotten to know each other very well. And Kelly, you know, eight, nine years, nine years, sorry. And, uh, it's uh, it's it really turned into a great musical family. I love these guys. I love working with them, yeah. and you know Mick Mick has set such set such a great example that uh, it's kind of easy to follow. What is the status of Mick and the band? I mean, I've seen two shows and he wasn't there. Now he was sick and and he was mm -hmm. t taking sort of a leave of absence. Uh, yeah, is he going to be there throughout the summer tour, or is it sort of like depending on his health? Mm -hmm. uh, what? I think so. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, people ask us. I mean, it's not like he knows, you know. <laughs> he doesn't really know until he sees how he feels. Uh, but, 
in general, he's doing great. He's 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 tanned. He's rested. He's ready to rock. Okay, good. good. <laughs> he loves these. Yeah, he loves these summer tours. So uh, we'll be seeing a lot of them. Good, good. I, I certainly hope so. And I'll ask you just one last question. And it's just going to go back to the Aerosmith days, if you don't mind. Uh, at okay. the time, they had a manager called Tim Collins, and the way it ended with Aerosmith wasn't very, you know, nice. Hmm. <laughs> oh, boy, that was a long time ago. You're right. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, you know, we're, we're, because the, the rumor or the, or the word on the street, for the lack of a better word, was that he was sort of a dictator, and he was telling you what you could have backstage and what you couldn't, and it was all about this alcohol and no drugs, and... Did you sense? Did, were you sensing any tension back in the day, or you did, you were because you're not really in the band? You, you never really sort of noticed any of it. Uh, I mean, you know, if you're talking about the stuff that was going on internally with them, I would certainly know about it peripher peripherally. Peripherally. <laughs> Right. Uh, I'm not going to get that. I'll let you say that for me. Peripherally? But from the outside, <laughs> yes, thank you. From the outside looking in, I knew about it. Um, and then there were rules. It was a time when they were clean and sober. And, right. you know, certain tours are like that. You're not allowed to drink or, or do drugs on your uh, work days, on your days off. You're sort of, you know, on your own. But when you're on your work place that you're not supposed to drink or do drugs and that was okay. fair enough you know but, uh, it, was, it actually kind of set a nice healthy tone there was a lot of carrot juice and wheatgrass and <laughs> the Aerosmith guys but we had weights backstage we were lifting weights and everything <laughs> it was wild yeah. but um, yeah I think the problem that happened between those guys was was more uh, certainly deeper than that okay. I don't think that was part of the tension at all it had to do with other things and so it unraveled the way it did, and it, and it was unfortunate that it, it did seem a bit messy. I'm sure Stephen talk, tells the whole story in his book. Right. Uh, so, yeah, people want to know what happened. It's all there. But um, it was just unfortunate that it did not end on a better note. And I think at that point they just moved on and, and never looked back, and they seem a lot more relaxed these days. Yeah, they really do, and, and hopefully they'll they'll yeah. come out with some new music, and, and, and I know they're doing a few shows this summer, but hopefully they'll do a lot more. Um, new yeah, music. I love the last album. There's really cool stuff on the album they just did. Yeah, which I have right in front of me, actually, uh, Music from Another Dimension. They, uh, yeah. Yeah. They, you know, they did that song Great with stuff. Carrie Underwood. It was, it, it, it was a good album. It was certainly a lot better than... Uh, that just push play album, but let's not get into bad mouthing. <laughs> let's not get into bad mouthing people or albums. Um, if, if, you, if you want to stop the tape, <laughs> I'll, I'll stop the tape after one last question. One last question: uh, New foreigner music, other than, uh, or I mean, like a new album at any point with with new songs coming out. I think I think there'll be some new material. You never know what form it'll take. Okay. I'm not sure it'll be a, a, a full album. With, what do they have to do? 14 songs on an album nowadays? Yeah. Uh, you know, and I don't think anyone really views it as necessary because right. they're going to throw them up on the internet. People are going to click on the samples and pick the ones they like. So you shouldn't feel pressured to do 12 or more songs. So I think you know there, there's a good chance we may do a song or two or three. Uh, you never know if it'll end up in a movie or a soundtrack. And uh, I think Mick just—he's one of those songwriters that, what do they say, a writer writes. Yeah. You know, they don't. They, they, it's just like me being a player. I have to play music. I don't have a choice in the matter. I think for him, it's like he has to write music uh, just be, because he's who he is. So that's probably never going to stop. And uh, we love it because, you know, he's, he's always got co something cooking. You know, he's always got like his batch of stuff cooking. And we just have to wait and see uh, how it finds its way out. Yeah, no, I, 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 I'm getting a sense from speaking to other artists that the album as an art form is sort of an outdated mode. It's sort of like, you know, beta tape or VHS. It, it had its purpose and everybody <laughs> loves it. But I, I think we're moving on. I think we're just, we're at three song EPs or, or one song singles. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Which is too bad. Yeah, it's too bad. It's great. It's, it's just a changing yeah, landscape in the music world and we adapt to change. You know, I don't think it ever makes sense to, to fight against change. You have to stop for me. I always feel like I have to embrace it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, I, I like yeah, that. I, I, w I was given uh, 15 minutes. We, we, we've, we've, 
way past that, but let's just remind the no folks. No problem. Soundtrack of summer. Of yeah, <laughs> soundtrack of summer tour with Sticks and Don Felder, and of course the soundtrack of summer album, which is coming out in May at uh, Walmart exclusively. Tom, it's, a, it's always a pleasure. Yeah. Just wanted to uh, to thank you, and uh, let me just—I'll turn off this tape for those Aerosmith stories now. Well, there you go. That was uh, Tom Gimble, the slash everything guy of uh, Foreigner, right? Slash guitarist, keyboardist, mm-hmm. backing vocalist, uh, saxophonist, uh, flutist, or do you say flautist? Flautist. Flautist. I think he plays a thimble. Yeah. And, and Man, a, and this a triangle. This, yeah, this and, guy's multi talented. I think he has shakers. Yeah. <laughs> he's got it all. <laughs> he's got it all. No, no, but you know what? Not only does he have it all, but but he's he's an ex- exceptionally nice guy. I've met him twice. Uh, mm-hmm. And I and I did this interview with him. Uh, super super friendly, super talented. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I thought his his point of view on Kelly was interesting and the the point being that it's not just about singing. Uh, Kelly brings this interaction with the right. crowd. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know... Uh, he's, an enter- he's an entertainer. Yeah. You know, at the yep. two shows I saw them in uh, Montreal, uh, you know, Kelly Hansen, formerly of Hurricane, with that great song, I'm uh, I'm On To You. Yep. He, he jumped into the crowd and he started walking over the chairs and he started taking peeper, uh, peepers... Peepers. 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 He started taking <laughs> people's... Uh, cameras and doing selfies with them and awesome yeah he's, de- he's stealing my licks yeah that's, all, that's awesome you know you need to interact with the crowd that's a that's a great uh, that's you know the, a true entertainer that's doing that. he's not just looking at his shoes thinking about what he's going to have for dinner after no so but so we're going to listen to jeff tilson of foreigner and of course formerly of Dawkin in a minute but yes. let's just get back to the topic at hand and i'll, I'll throw out um well you know Two or three more bands, and we'll get a quick right. comment. Um, there's a guy you're friends with named John Karabi. Yes. Uh, there you go. Yeah, we missed that topic. Yeah, he, he's, he's, I mean, let the <clears throat> folks know. I mean, how good of a friend is John? You, you've gone on tour with him a couple of times. He's been out to your house. Uh, yeah, John's a great friend. Uh, uh, I think you shared a bed once. Oh, well, we, we won't <laughs> we share a cell. Sell or two. John is a great guy, and there's another super talented cat, like and down to earth guy. He's just uh, a sweet, sweet guy, and, he, and you know, there's a great guy to interview. He's uh, he's yeah. a funny, funny character, and he's been through so much. And he's not some bitter bastard. He's and he's a super talented guy. You know, yeah, he really and is so, super talented. And so, what bands was John in? Well, listen, mm. John. John was the replacement singer in Scream. No, uh, no, John. Yeah, in Union. In, in Union. <laughs> no, he was the original singer of Union. Mm-hmm. But you know, he he came in uh, with Motley Crue. He came into Motley Crue, and and they did an album that was just simply called Motley Crue. And you look mm-hmm. at songs like um, "Smoke in the Sky" and "Hooligans Holiday." Awesome and, tune. Hooligans Holiday is one of the, my favorite songs by any bands of the last 40 years. Yeah, and, that's and a fun the, song. Yeah, you know, the album, if you look at it 20 years later and you're out of the moment, it's a great rock record. I mean, it's a great hard rock record. Yeah. But nobody gave it a chance Mostly because of the Nirvana grunge thing, and yeah, yeah, there was a bad, there's bad timing all around on that situation for sure. But there, there you go. There, there's a guy who came in who had all everything you needed, the talent, the personality, and the fans just didn't care. No, they didn't. No, it was uh, you know, and that's rough for John because uh, you know when you when I'm with John. That you know, obviously everyone talks about oh Motley Crue, Motley Crue, and they always are saying that that's their f- favorite Crue album, right? right. But J- John is a phenomenal singer and a, and a great entertainer too. But there's a tough spot. You can't. It doesn't matter. You know what I mean? The the band is it's it's already has its brand, and I hate using that term because that's one of but that's one that's one of your is favorite about branding. Yeah. It is, you know, and it's a signature sound and everything, right? You know, yeah. uh, but <laughs> it's so it it's, it's got it's got to be rough, and I can't imagine stepping into those shoes. And I, I don't think I would have the balls to be able to do that. You know what I mean? I I I'm proud of John for doing that, like at the time and everything. That you know, I'm sure you're 
you're blown away by the opportunity and everything, but to actually, you know, get up there and do it, that's, it's, it's a serious job. Are there jobs like lead singing for Motley Crue that no matter how great of a singer you are, you should just turn down because you know you're bound to fail because there are some singers that you can't replace. Like, you know, you, you could say, okay, well, I, I replaced Lou Graham in Foreigner and, and I'm doing a good yeah. job. Yeah. But, but Vince Neal's, whatever you want to call it, wail, whine, scream, yeah. whatever you, that really is the Motley Crue sound. And Exactly. I, I, I don't think it's replaceable. Yeah, well, and, you know, that's why this is a great topic. You could really talk about this a lot. and But, you know, I think in a situation like John's or, you know, other people, you got people don't give enough of a chance. I think they're so used to the original, you know, the way they think some something should be. And bands are always trying to move forward, you know what I mean? It, sometimes it's hard for us to have to play songs that, you know, there's songs that I don't like to play anymore, you know, but the band wants, the fans want to hear it and the band wants to play it. But I think the bands move on and fans kind of don't sometimes, you know what I mean? And that's understandable because it's the memory and everything, everything else about it. But I think if you gave someone a chance, you might've been, you know, like you said, Hooligans Holiday is an awesome, awesome tune, right? No matter who did it, it's a great song and great performance by everybody, but it's, you know, every everybody gets a bit fickle and stuff. You know what it's, sucks, though, is when a band changes a singer like Van Halen and like Motley Crue and all that, and then at some point down the road, they have a reunion with the original singer, and they throw all those songs out. Yep. I mean, yep. I, I, would, I would love to see Vince Neil do Hooligans Holiday. Yep. I would love to see... He probably um, he probably refuses to do it. I'm well, sure, he does. Right? He does. And and does David Lee Roth? You know, does he I sing would love to Sammy see stuff? No, not at all. And I I think it would be fantastic if he did right here, right now, or one of those songs. And, and the other one that that I think is is sort of a tragedy, and it's a band we haven't talked about yet is Black Sabbath. Yeah. I mean, mm. to hear right. Ozzy, you know, do Heaven and Hell yeah. or. Um, those are both those Sabbath albums with Dio are the best records. The yeah. Sabbath, to me, they are like uh, you know I give Ozzy his props because he's Ozzy, but you know Ronnie did a phenomenal job stepping into that gig, and those two records are mind blowing. I still listen to those you know oh, yeah. on, on a on a, on a regular basis and stuff. And then we saw Dio Disciples on the cruise, and they were freaking phenomenal. And you, you, you just forget almost how great these songs were and how great he was, you know what I mean? But the, it, this topic is amazing because it really makes you think about all these bands that have had all these changes. Yeah, well, let, let's, let's focus on Sabbath for one second. So Ozzy was great, and then he came in, and, and Ronnie took over and did So it was sort of like a Van Halen thing with, with Sammy and Dave where the band changed a little bit what they were doing and moved on as a new band. Yeah, it had a lot of success. It had a lot of success. But then you take a guy like Ian Gillen, who had huge success with Deep Purple. He was the voice of Deep Purple. They yep. threw him into Sabbath. Did work. And nobody cared. Yeah, People it didn't work. Yeah, and so? I think because the those deal records were so impressive, you know, they left such a mark. Like, you know, Black Sabbath fans, I'm sure they love those songs. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, yeah, Ian Gillen is, you know, he's up there in the top too, you know. But... It's I, it's up to the fans. If the fans aren't there, you have nothing. You're just guys jamming in a basement. <laughs> no, and you yes. look at another guy who's called sort of the voice of rock or whatever, which is Glenn Hughes. And, you know, he, he's done... Yep. Um, what, what else has he done? He, he's oh done Deep God. Purple. He's done Trapeze. Hughes he's, Thrall. Hughes Thrall. Uh, he's got a new band called California Breed, which we haven't heard yet. But yeah, um, Black, Black Country Communion. Black Country. Oh, that was that, that ended up being a, a bloody mess. Not not because of the, but because the, there was infighting. <clears throat> I know. I want to hear those that dirt when we're off the air because I don't know. And I love that record. I think I those those yeah. Bonamassa is amazing. But but here's another guy, Glenn Hughes, who before he joined Black Sabbath had enormous success. I mean, he really was you know the voice. Oh yeah, absolutely. And he comes into Black Sabbath, plays on an album with uh, with you know eventual Kiss drummer Eric Singer, mm -hmm. and, and people go, yeah, and yeah, well, 
Yeah, I get it. it's you know it's 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 like gambling, making records and writing songs. It's you know it it, it either hits a heart or it doesn't. I guess you know that's why I guess we just keep making keep making music. Keep making music and. And so, listen. Let, let, let's finish up with uh, with Jeff Pilson of uh, yes, because I got a pack. Yes, I know you're going on tour. So, so let me wrap this up, and I'll and I'll throw one last thing out at you. Uh, okay. They're out on tour with um, Sticks and Don Felder, and of course, Sticks has a local Canadian oh, yes. boy, uh, a, a guy that we all grew up knowing as the Criminal Mind. That's right, Gowan. Lawrence, Lawrence now, Gowan. Now in Sticks, he has become Laurence, or Lawrence Gowan. Um, Just call me Larry. You know, they, they haven't had phenomenal success in terms of chart success like they did with Dennis DeYoung. Yeah. But touring-wise, they have been packing arenas and sheds and summer sheds and, and festivals. Yeah, because so, they have a classic catalog. Those those stick songs are uh, unbelievable, and they're a great live band. They're great singers, and all of them are. You know, you have Tommy Shaw and James Young. Those those these guys are lead singers in their own right. Right, but is you know that the I point mean? we're missing though? <clears throat> that it really doesn't amount to the singers. It amounts to the quality of the songs. And if you go back and we talk about Glenn Hughes, and we talk about Ian Gillen, and we talk about Johnny Solinger, and we talk about mm. all these other guys mm -hmm. yep. that haven't had successes with the bands, you look at the albums they've made, a lot of the albums they made, or, or, or Gary Sharon, for example, yep. it just really wasn't good material. But bands yeah. where they've made good material, Dio, Sammy, etc. Yeah, you know, Bonds, uh, not Bon Scott, uh, yeah. Brian, Bri Johnson. Brian, yeah. I think it, I think it, com I think it comes down to the chemistry. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's, it's. There's, a, there's so many talented people. You could, you know, replace anybody uh, by this conversation. This is what it sounds like to me. And you know, I think it's up to the chemistry that you have with the other people in the band. You know what I mean? Because it's. If you put, if we could put our finger on it, then we'd be, you know, we'd be the million dollar babies, right? Yeah, which is another great band, by the way. Yeah, million but, dollar uh, babies. Yes, I, I guess I we shouldn't play this episode of the uh, podcast for your band members because they might start going. Ah, Russell they don't said he was yeah. irreplaceable. <laughs> they don't speak English anyway, so it's it's, it's not a problem. Yeah, you, you, you they got a bunch of foreigners in your band. Yeah, bunch of foreigners. They speak in rum. Yeah, exactly. and I'll I'll be seeing them in less than twenty four hours. So, so there you go. So, yeah. so so let's wrap up this one. <clears throat> let's listen to uh, foreigner bassist and 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 backup vocalist uh, Jeff Pilson. He. Uh, he go. He you know. He talks to us, of course, about the uh, upcoming summer tour called the Soundtrack of Summer, featuring uh, Foreigner Sticks and Don Felder. He um, we talk about the Soundtrack of Summer CD, which is available exclusively of Walmart. That has uh, eight Foreigner songs, eight Stick songs, and a brand new version of Hotel California. Where, Holy smokes, I'm going to Walmart right now. I know, where all the guitarists and all these people mix and match, and, and they all the, the guys from Styx and the guys from Foreigner and, of course, Don, all get together and put out this great version. And the other thing I talked to Jeff about is a Foreigner release called I Want to Know What Love Is, uh, The Ballads, which was released, unfortunately, only in Europe. It's a double <laughs> CD that includes, all, of course, all the ballads, but the yes. second CD is a uh, show that they recorded in June of 2013, the Foreigner guys, and it's all acoustic. And I have the CD. I actually bought it at uh, Amazon uh, Germany, or Amazon.de for those who care. Amazing. And um, it's just a fantastic, what those guys do acoustically is fantastic. Yeah. And of course, listen, it wouldn't be a Jeff Pilsen interview without a hmm. few comments about his old band, hmm. Dawkins. Yes. And there you go. So let's let, awesome. let's let's listen to uh, to Jeff. So we are here today with Jeff Pilson of Foreigner. How you doing, Jeff? I am doing fabulous. Lots of lots of great news coming out of the Foreigner camp. Um, you got a summer tour with Styx and Don Felder. So l let's yes. start with that. Um, great bill. Yeah, yeah, we're we're really, really, really excited about it, and the reaction so far has been phenomenal. And 
I'm telling you, it's going to be such an amazing tour. People are going to freak out. The music on this tour, when they leave, they're going to, they're going to after the show, they're going to say, wow, that is a lot of great music. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you come to Styx and to Foreigner, we know it's just going to be top 10 hit after top 10 hit. Uh, what is Don going to be offering the folks? Do you know? Well, he's going to be playing the Eagles songs that he was okay. a contributor for. So, yeah, he's, I mean... Uh, he's great, man. Don is absolutely wonderful. And, and you know, one thing that we're doing, we did a re-record of Hotel California. Oh, really? And, yes. And Don Felder, Tommy Shaw, and Kelly Hansen, former singer, all trade off the vocals. Oh, wow. And, and at the end of the song, Don Felder, Tommy Shaw, and Mick Jones all trade solos. And it's really, really cool. It starts off very acoustic and it ends up very electric. It's really a cool version. And that's going to be available on a commemorative tour CD that we'll be selling at the shows. And I also think it's going to be a download that's available too. So um, you got to watch for that. It's really, really a fun, fun version. So what's this exclusive CD going to be? I mean, is it just the one track or is it going to no, be a collection no, of 10 tracks? It's going to be 17 songs as well. Wow. Yeah, I believe it's eight sticks, eight foreigner, and then the Hotel California re remake. Just you know, um, it's going to be a really great tour CD. Well, wow, that's, that's 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 actually a great concept. Now, you know, Journey years ago had people when they walked in, they got the the CD free with the um, purchase of a ticket. Prince did the same thing. Uh, is this part of the ticket price, or is this sort of at the merch booth? Um, this is, uh, bu 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 some, um, you know what? I honestly don't know. I'm pretty sure it's at the mer merch booth. Yeah, either either sure. way, it's, it's, it's yeah, exceptionally yeah. cool. Now, now speaking of new recordings, I want to show the folks this thing. This yeah. is called Foreigner, the ballads. And of course yes. it has all the great hits. I want to know what love is waiting for a girl like you, but on the back, there's a little special CD, a whole acoustic evening with Foreigner, recorded in July of 2013 out in Germany. Yes. And you're credited for rearranging a lot of the classic songs into these new sort of acoustic monsters. Tell me a little bit about all the work that went into that and, and about this package. Well, <clears throat> first of all, um, I, I love doing this. is something I love to do. I love to <clears throat> rearrange songs, especially doing them acoustically. I love that. It's one of my favorite things to do because I've always been a big vocal guy. I love vocals. And I love harmony vocals. And you really get to hear the harmonies when we do it acoustically like that. Um, but, you know, I mean, having said that, I mean, I'm working with such a phenomenal group of musicians. It's not like it's a lot of work no. for me to do. It's pretty simple. It's all... It's, a, it's just a matter of getting us all to, uh, to sing together and play together. And I'll tell you, it's, a, it's an amazing package. Um, it really is. I mean, I, I bought this one. I, I didn't get this for free. And I listened to it, and it is fantastic. Yeah, we're really, really excited. And that acoustic show was just a real magical moment. Um, <clears throat> you know, we, uh, uh, we, do, we do acoustic shows from time to time. But we hadn't actually done one for a while. Right. So it was really fun to do one sort of out of nowhere like that. But we did it in Germany. Uh, had this wonderful crowd. Um, the Germans really, really do love the acoustic stuff. Um, and it was just one of those magical evenings. It just turned into a great night. So that's why we thought, well, let's give something really extra special for this package. And as well as the ballads and as well as the, the popular songs that you know, uh, let's give them something that they can really, you know, really sink their teeth into. And so that was why, that was the reasoning behind that. And this package has just been, it's been really, really a lot of fun to put together and something I'm very, very proud of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and now I, I picked this out out of Europe. Will it be uh, released domestically in uh, Canada and the U.S.? I don't know about Canada. I know there's no plans to release it in the U.S. at oh, this point. Too bad. Um, yeah, too bad. But, you know, you never know. Some, when things catch on, that, uh, you know, that could, it could always be the case. Uh, I have a feeling it'll be available at shows as well. Um, Absolutely should be, quite frankly. Yeah, I, I, I agree. So I'm, I'm glad you like it, man. Yeah, now... Uh, let's talk a little bit about the band Foreigner. You know, the, with the tour coming out and this album, there seems to be a real resurgence of Foreigner, and it seems as though it took a little bit of time to sort of rebuild the brand with all the, the new band members. Mm -hmm. how, was it a struggle? How, how was it, and how's it going now? It seems to be going It was a struggle in some areas. Okay. Um, Europe being a prime example, actually. In Europe, uh, when we first inquired about going over into Europe, which was around 2005, and we first went there in 2006, uh, there wasn't a lot of interest in Foreigner, to be perfectly honest yeah. with you. There was, there, was um, there had been some damage done to the name, and uh, 
you know, the promoters were just not that excited. So we went back there and, you know, old school style, we went and slashed it out. We went there every year. We, you know, we stayed in crappy hotel rooms. We did the whole bit mm-hmm. like a new band would do. And we built it up. And now when we go to Germany, we play 5,000 seaters. We're having tremendous attendance. There's a demand. That's one of the reasons why that ballad album is out. Right. Um, so we've really built it up. And, and I think, you know, to a certain extent, that's the case worldwide. Um, I think it was less of a struggle in the States than it was in Europe, but uh, it's just really rewarding to see how we've brought it back now. And, you know, now we're doing this, this big tour this summer and, and it's getting a lot of attention. And, you know, the fact that we can go on the Tonight Show the other night yeah. and things like that. And Fox and of, Friends. Yeah. yeah, and Fox and Friends. And to be able to do all that stuff, yeah, it's very satisfying. You know that we built the brand and that makes us very excited. Was it frustrating at any time during all of that? I mean, were there times where you just said, why are we doing this? Never why are we doing this okay. because we were very determined. It was frustrating in I think I think Mick in particular was frustrated when, when Europe was a struggle at first. Right. But I think Mick is also the the most pleased at how much we brought it to life in Europe and I think uh the frustration has been borne out now with, with tremendous satisfaction, which yeah. is what you want. Now now I'm gonna show you one other thing that I don't know if you, you're aware of. Uh in the in Europe, Rock Candy Records re-released and remastered all the early Dawkin albums. And, and, and I know it's, it's been a while since you've been in the band and stuff, but just quickly, what did Tooth and Nail and Under Lock and Key and, of course, uh, the first album, or Breaking the Chains, mean to you? Well, I mean, they, were, they meant an awful lot to me. Right. Um, I mean, that was... That was uh, that was my, you know, th- that was my baby, and that was my training grounds, and that was, that was my family, that was, you know, it was everything. I mean, Dokken is, is and will always be extremely <laughs> important to me. Okay. Um, I have not heard the remasters yet. I've heard from other people that they sound good. I, you know, again, I haven't, I had really nothing to do with that. Um, of course. And I'll tell you, they do sound great. I mean, they yeah. really cleaned them up very nicely. A couple of bonus tracks on one of the albums, on Tooth and Nail. But they sound great. They really sound great. The bonus tracks on Tooth and Nail. Uh, you've got the uh, Just Got Lucky radio edit, and then okay. you've got uh, Alone Again live in Japan, 1987. Okay, gotcha. gotcha. But it sounds great. I mean, they did a, they did a really great job. Um, you know, Dawkins Dawkin was a great band. Did, yeah, did, did, did you miss I, playing with them? Um, no, I miss certain aspects of it, sure. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm, I've got a really nice gig now. Uh, yeah. Do. Um, but, you know, there is something to be said about being in a band where, you know, you write, you know, you, you're one of the writers and, you know, and all that kind of thing. So, yeah, I miss that part. I'm, I certainly miss play, playing with uh, George and Mick musically because, you know, we musically we had such an amazing chemistry. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I have a lot of love for Don Doc, and, you know, we, there, there's been struggles over the years and whatnot, but I think it's mellowed into something where I, I have a lot of love for the guy, and I wish him the best. And, you know, we had a chemistry, too, that you know, when, when it was firing on all cylinders was pretty damn great. So, yeah, there's things about it I miss. I mean, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm too busy to miss anything very much right now but uh but sure i miss it yeah. but, and that's some of some of the stuff i want to ask you about too because you're doing some producing and, and and you're doing stuff for i think uh is it rat pack records or something like that and, you, and you've uh, done oh, war and geez. peace and yeah. what is what, what is jeff doing other than this playing bass and singing in foreigner uh well i mean yeah i have i mean you know i produced a starship record that came out a few months ago is that the one that included the kiss cover no there was a uh, nothing, no. nothing compared. No, nothing can keep me away from you. Some of like that. Uh, oh, nothing. Yeah, that that's not. A, is that a Kiss cover? Because that, is, I, that is a Kiss cover. Oh, well, that's funny. I knew it was a Diane Warren song, but uh, okay. Well, I didn't know it was a Kiss cover. Um, I don't think they ever uh, knew that the Kiss, <laughs> yeah, the Kiss version. <laughs> um, uh, and I actually I didn't do that song. That's one of yeah. two songs that I didn't do on the record. Okay. But um, uh, that was such a labor of love. I loved it. I mean, Mickey Thomas is just phenomenal. One of the greatest singers ever. Great. And still has just the most amazing pipes. Is a sweetheart of a guy. We got along so famously. Um, it was. It w- didn't feel like work. It was just so much fun. Then I produced the uh, the Kill Devil Hill record, which came out in October with, with Vinnie Apice and Rex Rex Brown. That was a blast. Yeah. Those guys yeah. and, and those guys are great. I mean, oh yeah. You know, this summer. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. My wife's father passed away, and I put it by cancer, and we put together a Kiss tribute CD, and both Vinny and Rex played on it. 
Oh, right, right. And, and they just donated their time. They donated the songs. You couldn't ask for, for nicer people, quite frankly. Okay, they really, really are. I, I, I totally agree. Yeah. Well, that's great, man. That, that's, that's, that's very cool. Very cool uh, of them. Yeah, and, and you know what? I love them to pieces, too. And we just had a great experience. And that's one of those things that uh, I think I'll be proud of for a very, very long time. Is it hard for you to go from a more softer, melodic rock album like uh, Starship into a more of a heavy metal Kill Devil Hill album? No, actually. I, I think one complements the other. One, uh, If I didn't have that kind of variety, I think I'd get a little, um, uh, you know, a little stale. narrow. Yeah, not only about stale, but I, I think my vision wouldn't be as open. Right. You know, I like to keep my, my, my sights open to what, what's out there. Because to me, it's all music. It shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't be, you know, people that only like heavy music or only like this or, you know, I, I find that to be, that's not how I work. I love all music. Right. Um, so when I get to work on various types of music, uh, it, it's actually very stimulating to me and, and does help keep, keep my perspective, you know, kind of sharp. So no, it's not difficult at all. Are you working on any other projects right now? Uh, well, I've... Um, I, well, I've been doing a lot of fun work lately, which has been yeah. crazy. Um, I did do a, a Dio tribute song uh, with Rowan Robertson, Oni Logan, Brian Tishy, and Jimmy Payne. I produced a, a, a song on the on the Dio tribute record, which was "I" by Black Sabbath, and 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 those guys doing it. That was a oh, blast. That's that was such great. a great song. Yeah, and and wait to hear Oni sing it, and wait to hear the band playing it. We we gave it. We gave it a very raw, gutsy treatment that I'm really, really proud of. Um, and then, um, and then I, I actually played on one song with uh, Vinny Apice, Doug Aldrich, um, myself, and Rob Halford, and we did uh, "Man on a Silver Mountain," which is pretty cool. Yeah, so. I'm looking at it right here. It is called. It is called. It's called "This Is Your Life." Right. The Ronnie James Dio tribute album. Oh, great! And, great. Uh, yeah, you're right there, "Man on the Silver Mountain," and. Uh, yeah. Right after that, there's a whole Metallica. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. On. That, that, the the uh, the, um, the personnel on the record is pretty stellar. <laughs> yeah, you know, I got the press release yesterday, and I and I thought, oh, it's just a, a greatest hits. And then I started reading it, and I went, Metallica, what? Rob, who, who, what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm in. Yeah. I want one of those. I guess yeah. the the million dollar question uh, for for foreigner fans: new music, new album, anything? Uh, we're starting to talk about it. Um, okay. We're talking about maybe starting to re record um, or at least start working on a new record after this summer tour. So okay. we also have an acoustic tour of Germany in the fall. So it's going to be a little tricky. Um, but, you know, we've just we've had to learn how to work on stuff while we're doing a lot of other things. That's just that there's just so much going on. So but yes, there's talking new music. So that's yeah, going to be great. That's gonna be great. Also, yeah. I don't think you know about this, too, but we're also going to be recording a live DVD of doing the entire Foreigner 4 record coming up this fall. Really? Yeah, before we go to Europe for the acoustic tour, we're going to be doing that. And that's going to be great. There's going to be some special guests, some surprises. It's going to be really amazing. And just quickly, if you can fill in the details, is that going to be part of a show at, at you know, at whatever, Club Nokia or at the Whiskey it's, or something? It's going, to be a, it's going to be at a show. Um, from what I understand now, the show is in Atlantic City, and it's it's going to be done over three shows. Wow! In early October, um, things could change, I suppose, but that's the plan right now. Uh, and um, if people are good enough and loving enough, maybe we'll hit the road sometime again, doing it on the road. Sort of an album tour. Oh, those are those are great. You know, Cheap Trick a few years ago did their first three albums, three nights in a row in cities. Uh, how great! It's How fantastic. Great. You know, it's a great concept. Ronnie did Holy Diver, and that was a huge success. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we, we're, 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 we've hit the 15-minute mark, so I don't want to keep you all day. Uh, where are we finding you? Uh, Twitter, Facebook? What are we plugging? Uh, tw Twitter, yep. I'm, I'm, I'm there on Twitter. Um, uh, I, I think it's just hashtag Jeff Pilsen, if I'm or not mistaken. Jeff Pilsen, right. right. Jeff Pilsen, yeah. Uh, and then, fa yeah, my Facebook Jeff Pilsen fan page is, is there on Facebook. I'd love to have people come to that. Um, just look for all that. And, uh, you know, um, I, I guess uh, the main thing is just, you know, keep listening. Everybody's been so cool. Oh, and uh, in case you're asking, you said something about Rat Pack Records. George and I are talking. We want to do another TNN record as soon as we can. It's just a question of time. So we're hoping we get to that one of these days soon. But uh, just kind of, you know, if, if you could make more time in the day, we'd be, we'd be set. <laughs> 
you, you need a 28 hour day, right? I, or more. <laughs> but listen, hey, things have turned out great for you. I mean, uh, very you know, happy. after everything went down with Doc and here you're in Foreigner and you've made this band great. I mean, your sense yeah. of melodies, all these arrangements, uh, the touring, it's can't complain. Well, well thank you. I mean, uh, like I say, I'm in tremendous company there. So. <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's hard when you change the singer to get people to come back and believe in, and, the, in the band. And that's amazing. Well, but, but, but part of that is just because Kelly Hansen is so good. Yeah. It, oh, yeah. It's just so good. There's no denying it. Uh, people have got to go back and check his uh, Hurricane albums. They were they were brilliant. Yeah. So there but you go. Say he is really shining in this band. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so uh, this summer, you know, get a ticket, get out to one of those shows. Yeah, get man. Out there. We're get excited. Out there. We're excited. Thank you as always, Jeff. Thank you, Mitch. Always a pleasure. Well, there you go. There you go, Russ. We we man. got uh, Tom Gimbel, Jeff yeah. Wilson. Great Super discussion. Yeah. It, great, it, very interesting guys. Very oh, awesome. Guy. And a super discussion about replacing lead singers. And of course, you are one, and you're mm -hmm. one of these guys that say, no, no, you can't replace them. But we have proven through Sammy Hager and, and Bruce Dickinson and yes. Rob Halford that you're all yeah. replaceable. Yeah, you're right. It's it, it was interesting to talk about that because it really puts a different perspective on right. on everything for sure. You're like Lego. We can just pull out the yellow yeah. block and put in a red block, and the the thing's still going to be a truck. That's right. The poor lead singers. Oh my god. <laughs> That's okay. Ne next episode, we'll talk about how easy uh, we can replace drummers. Okay. So <laughs> yeah, Dar my roommate Daryl will love that. <laughs> exactly, and of course, folks. Uh, you are listening to the one-on-one uh, -on -one with Mitch LaFon podcast, part of the Talking Metal Digital Network. Check out TalkingMetal.com. And, of course, check out the other podcast, part of the network, the Talking Metal podcast, the Talking Rock podcast, and the Mars Attack podcast. Till next episode, see ya. Bye. <laughs>